Hello everyone, I'm Lindsay the Frugal Crafter and today we are going to paint a watercolor bouquet of a uh, bunch of flowers in a mason jar. Here in the studio with me today I have my daughter Maisie. Say hello. Hi. And she will be relaying questions to me that you might have. We also have a legion of talented moderators in the chat that will help you out if you have questions. So between all of us, we will get your questions answered. Just be patient because we're all humans and we're all underneath like feet and feet of snow. So, you know, we're, we're all just doing the best we can. Um, we're going to start off by sketching and um, you can use a regular pencil. I'm going to use a, a gray watercolor pencil um, just to, uh, you know, so I can kind of dissolve some of the lines if I want to. I'm also going to sketch a little darker than um, than you probably want to just so to make sure you can see it. So I'm going to start off with my mason jar. I'm going to start off with a uh, horizontal line for the top of it and one for the bottom here. And then this is a little trick and I get asked a lot about this. How do you keep when you're drawing a jar or something, how do you keep it symmetrical? Well, what I do is I draw one side and for me, it's I draw the left hand side because it's just so much easier for me to get the left hand side of something. And then I turn it around and then I draw the right hand side. So for whatever reason, that just makes it easier for me to get it fairly um, fairly symmetrical that way. So I encourage you to give that a try if you have um, struggles with that as well. I think it's because, you know, we, uh, we either have a left or right, right side dominant brain. So if we can kind of confuse our brains a little bit like that, flip it around, it just makes it a little bit easier. So there, we've got a fairly, fairly symmetrical looking jar there. And uh, um, yes, do we have a question? Well, this isn't really related to water, but um, Molly McAusson asks, do you have cats? How are, they, how are they not constantly helping you paint? Oh, the cats. You know, my, I have the most unfriendly cats in the world, and they are not interested at all in what I'm up to. <laughs> in fact, they hide from me most of the time. Well, sometimes Tally will jump up and, you know. Tally, Tally will hop up here when I'm not around, drink from my water bowl, and leave cat hair, but that's about it. I'm just going to very loosely sketch in that cursive care label. And I'm not really going to put more than that because it's going to get washed out. And then for the flowers themselves, I'm going to put in a few, few details, not very much, just to kind of get an idea of where things are going to go and that's pretty much it okay so I've got it doesn't it's not a lot of detail but I have kind of just mapped out where I want things to be and the first thing I'm going to do is grab a big watercolor brush this is a number 30 mimic I'm going to use the same brushes I use all the time uh, they are my favorites and they're pretty affordable they are the um, the mimic Faux Squirrel from a Creative Mark, so you can find them on Amazon or Jerry's Artorama. They are um, pretty affordable. I don't know if you can get them outside of the United States, though, so that's the only thing I want to caution you about. And I'm going to throw some water inside the jar here, and also some on the tabletop. So if I tip this to the light, maybe you can see where I have wet my paper. So it's just really uh, kind of haphazard, because when I wet, when I add my color, I kind of want my paint just to kind of flow and go. You can wet some of these flowers maybe here. Very, very loose. Question, um, what watercolor brushes and paint do you recommend to advance to advance in watercolor? I really recommend these Mimic brushes. If you can't get these where you live, try the um, Princeton Neptune or the Royal Nickel Zen. And for paints, any, any good quality artist watercolor is going to be fine. I mean, they're all so good nowadays that, um, you know, if you're getting it from a reputable company, it's going to be, it's going to be fine. I'm going to go with this um, turquoise color here. I'm going to be putting more color than what's in the reference photos, just so that you know. If you don't have this particular color, use thalo blue and add a little bit of um, thalo green to it. And I'm just adding it into the jar. And I'm also going to let spill out into the area that I've wet on the tabletop. I'm going to grab some 
uh, sap green. And paint some of these. I'm gonna paint some of the um, the foliage here, but I'm not gonna. I'm um, where it hits places I've wet. It's gonna give me a really cool uh, loose effect, and that's really what I'm going for with this. I'm working on Arches paper, which is a beautiful 100% um, cotton paper, and it just gives you. Um, when you're doing a technique like this, you, you let the supplies kind of show through as well. It's not just your painting skill. You actually have some beautiful paper that's going to do its own thing and be lovely. I'm going to take some of the turquoise color we just used with the sap green. And I think I'm also going to add a red. Let's use... Um, Let's use a cad red deep here. What paint set are you using? This is the Rembrandt set of 48. I did manage to get it linked up on my um, on my blog, but I didn't get too many details here on the um, on the YouTube watch page. So if you just go to the frugalcrafter.wordpress.com, you will see all that additional information. And plus a sneak peek into my winter working space because I typically work in my basement, but it's too cold in the winter. So I showed you how to set up a craft area in a small space. So if you are, um, if you are an artist, don't, that doesn't have a lot of space to work with, but you want to be creative uh, with what you have, try that out. Cause I think there's some ideas there that you can implement and you know, it's just using stuff from around the house that you already have. Um, and that's on the blog post today as well. I didn't know if I'd be even able to broadcast today. I thought we'd probably lose power. So I didn't have, um, uh, I didn't have much planned, so I thought it would be a good chance to share that. Just putting some um, Hansi Yellow Light in there. I'm going to tip that up a little bit more so you can see. Um, I have quite a bit of light on this table, and I just want to make, there we go. I want to make sure that you have enough light to see everything good, but you're not completely drowned out by light. Now I'm going to try some of the turquoise and see what happens if I go in close to some of these yellow flowers. I think that might be kind of pretty. Let the color do its thing. So I, I, I had this comment and I thought it was really insightful. And the person that left the comment had Canton XL watercolor paper. And she's like, I've soaked my paper and I can't get my paint to move. Sometimes, and this seems completely counterintuitive, sometimes when you, um, and this is a, like a cad yellow deep, sometimes when you put too much water on your paper, it actually acts in an opposite manner than the way you expect. If you have too much water on your paper, sometimes your paint won't move because it wants to soak back up into your brush because your brush is drier than the paper. So keep that in mind. If you are like, I cannot get my paper, my paint to move and my I can't get my paper any wetter, it's just sopping, it could be your paper's too wet. Try blotting it off a little bit and making sure you have more paint and water in your brush, that your brush is more saturated than your paper. So the paint will and water will want to go to the place where there's less saturation, it's good. It always wants to balance. So if your brush is super wet and your paper is only damp, that water is going to want to whoosh right into the damp area and come out of the super, super wet area. So think about the water wanting to go wherever, you know, it wants to equal out. It wants an equilibrium. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but I think that will, um, I think a lot of people have that issue and it's, um, it's just the, the paint wants to, wants to equal itself out. The, the water wants to equilibrium there. Um, Laura asked when we have a video on your small crafting space. Um, I can do a video on my small crafting space. I don't have one yet, but I totally could do a little video on that. I'm going to grab, let's see, I actually think I want a magenta because that's a more versatile color. Whenever you're like debating on what colors to get, if you don't have a lot, go with your brighter, more transparent ones because you'll be able to mix more colors from them. And this is magenta here. It's a fabulous color. The quinacridone magentas are actually pretty light fast too, because usually with these brighter colors, you get worried that perhaps your um, they will fade. And that's the case with like a lot of colors like opera, which is a really, really bright pink, but your quinacridones are actually a little bit more stable than some of those other colors. So give them a try. You get to have the magenta, the, I mean, you get to have the vivid colors without, a, uh, without the fading. And I'm just flicking some of that on because it's pretty, I like that color. You don't have to, it's up to you. 
I want to pull some of those greens into the vase as well. So I'm going to do that now. Add a little yellow into those stems. And you can see that even though we sketched with a water soluble graphite or a water soluble pencil, a gray one, it's not muddying anything up. So um, so don't be afraid to, to dig in and use those, use those colors. I feel like I want a little fresh color in here. I'm gonna go with my sap green. Um from Cecilia. How do you know how much water is enough? I find that mine has either dried before I get to that spot or the paper gets chewed up easily. It's it's really practice. I find that if you have a higher quality paper, it can take the it can take the loads of water. And by higher quality paper, I would be talking about like an Arches, um, the Langton Prestige, Fabriano Uno, Stonehenge, something that's got 100% cotton content is going to hold up really well to that. You don't have to. Um, even like Aqua Bee paper is very affordable, and that's 100% cotton. Um, it's not quite as heavily sized as an Arches, so it is going to not be quite as robust. But, um, you know, it's practice, but also making sure that you have a, a paper that's going to do what you want it to do. Uh, I want to have a little bit of a, of a background here, just kind of like a, maybe like a tabletop. So I'm just going to wet a horizontal area. And then I'm going to drip in some color. Since I haven't used any brown yet, I think... I could mix my own brown or I could integrate a brown that I think I'll want to use. I'm going to grab some um, burnt sienna here because that's such a versatile color. When trying to create lighter areas on rocks with a credit card or scratching to get lighter twigs, etc., I often do not do not get any or sometimes get dark lines, not light. What is the secret? When you're scraping, um, if you want to get a lighter line, you have to kind of let it, let the... Um, paper sit for a, like a like a couple minutes like maybe two minutes and then you can scrape and what that will do is it will kind of squeegee the paint out if you want a darker line you want to do it right as soon as it's wet and you put the paint down and you want to scrape like what I'll do is I'll use like um I have a credit card scraper here I think I do let's see. right here so if I'm, if I'm doing, if I want to scrape and I uh, want to have a, a light line, I'll scrape across like that. But if I want to have a dark line, I'll slice it like I'm trying to slice something with a knife like that. Um, so that way, if you have a broader area scraping across, you're going to squeegee. And if you have a sharper area scraping uh, through, you're going to get that scribing or that, you know, you're going to have that groove that damages the paper that the paper seeps into. And again, it's one of those situations where you want to practice because that's how you're going to, that's how you're going to learn the technique that's going to work well for you. Um, I'm going to get some more color inside the vase and I think I want to have a little bit of like a water line in here. So I'm blotting my brush. I want to take some of the extra out. I'm going to grab some of that turquoise and a little bit of um, the burnt sienna here. How do you know what colors to pick when painting without a reference? Um, well, I am using a reference, but oh, sorry, that was probably really loud. I just hit my microphone. Um, but I'm just trying to like pump up colors. I generally will go by colors that I like, or I will, if I see like a teeny little bit of magenta, I'll really boost it up and use a lot of it. So it's kind of a combination of you, of kind of being inspired by what's already there and then kind of going on and doing my own thing as well. What would be pro brushes and watercolor? Um, well, silver makes some pro brushes. I would say usually professionals will use like the Kalinsky, like the, tr the true Kalinsky brushes, uh, sables, I, or red squirrel, but I don't just because um, there are so many good synthetics and there's actually a lot of really good budget brushes that, that perform really well nowadays. So um, series seven is probably like the, the one people talk about the most because that one was actually made for the Queen of England by Windsor and Newton. So that's probably what you would refer to as like probably one of the prime watercolor brushes. But um, I really like Princeton Neptune. I know plenty of professionals that use Princeton Neptune and they are completely um, animal friendly. I don't know too many that use the, um, 
the Mimics. I think they're fairly new, but I love these. I like them more than the Neptunes, actually. And they are a little bit cheaper. So I think, I mean, the barrier to entry of getting a good brush is a lot lower than it used to be. What I'm doing here is I'm blotting my brush and I'm setting it in the, these puddles so that I can go in and add some more color without having blooms because I want to add a little definition to some of these flowers, but I don't just want everything to whoosh together. So I'm drawing my brush off again. I'm gonna go in with a little bit of color and um, and it's it's pretty dry. I'm picking it right off the off the uh, the pan, but I am not um, I'm not adding any water to my brush. Um, Janice, uh, what is the paint palette? Can you show us the front of your paint palette, please? Oh sure. This is the Rembrandt set of forty eight. Um, I have to tell you that this is really expensive right now on Amazon, but sometimes it goes on sale. Um, I got this for one thirty four. And it's like currently like 220 or something. So um, I would just keep your eyes open if you want this set of paints because they do. I, I've seen it down to 134 a couple of times. It was just down to 134 like a week ago, and I had mentioned it. Uh, but they, you know, they sold a bunch and they jacked the price back up. I don't know why they do that. I guess they probably lower it to get uh, people interested. But um, but I really like it. It's um it's a really nice vibrant paint. Getting some of the edges of the flowers. I'm not going to put any serious detail yet because everything's still so wet. I'd want to dry it off a little bit before I did that. I'm going to do the same thing with some CAD Red and this flower over here. What size brushes do you use the most? I would say I probably use a number um, anywhere between a number eight and a number 12. Like this is a number 12 round, the most for watercolor. I think your rounds are your most versatile and valuable brushes when you're in watercolor. So if you can only afford um, one good brush, make it like a number eight round, or number 10 round, or number 12 round. Uh, make sure it's one that comes to a nice point like these mimics do. And you're gonna be able to get tiny, fine details all the way up to big washes of color. And especially if you like to travel with your paints, uh, they're great because you don't have to bring a bunch of brushes to get a bunch of effects. And then you can build your skills while you learn your brush control. Do you like Turner Jewel tone watercolors? Um, I like the Turner watercolors. I don't know about the Jewel tone. Is that like a, it might be one of the specialty sets of four that I don't have. I do have some more Turner paints coming though because I pretty much used up everything in my 18 color set that I was working on before. All right, at this point I'm going to uh, dry this. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask while I'm drying. It's just too wet for me to do anything else to at this stage. Are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a lag too, so yeah. There, yeah. And if you get, if you're sp uh, spattering and you get paint, uh, paint a little out of hand, just go ahead and blot it right away and most of it should come up. are watching in chat, Maisie? Uh, 364. Holy cow, that's awesome! Must be a lot of snowed in people out there. <laughs> well, they're talking about um, college art schools. Do you know any good ones? Oh, Rhode Island School of Design is probably the premier um, art school in the country for... And it's also a good one that people seem to be able to have productive careers mm -hmm. after okay. graduating. I didn't go to art school though. Here's a question by Carol. Okay. Is there an advantage to having a lot of different watercolor brands? I hope so. Maybe I can just stop buying. <laughs> Carol wants to know if there's an advantage to having a lot of different watercolor brands. You know, um, you can. If she wanted to stop buying paint, is that the is that what she said, or she wanted to keep buying paint? Uh, or maybe no. I just can't stop buying. You can't stop buying. Um, I would say there's no advantage or disadvantage. Um, it's fun to try different paints and if that keeps you inspired and keeps you painting more frequently then I think it's a great thing. Um, I have to say though I think you learn a lot quicker um, with a limited palette so even if you love collecting lots and lots of paint 
I would recommend that you still only use um, under six colors in a painting or somewhere around that just so you don't get too overwhelmed and you learn how your colors work together. Um, I recommend my students start out with a limited palette of nine colors and that would be two reds, two yellows, two blues, a warm and cool of each uh, color of each of those primaries and then a sap green, burnt sienna and yellow ochre because you, sap green's a convenience color but the other um, the other two are just really great neutrals. Uh, they're single pigment that are that are great to um, to use so when you have a limited palette you have fewer variables so if something goes wrong you know if it's one of your colors or if it's something else and you just when you have too many colors on your palette uh, and too many variables and, and something goes wrong you might not know exactly where your problem is okay you have like four questions now okay um does bleed proof marker pad work for watercolors no that's designed for alcohol pens i mean you there's no reason why you can't try it with it but with uh with watercolors but i think it's going to wrinkle up on you it's it's not designed for that type of medium. There's no one paper that's going to be great for everything. Everything has its own, um, its own best use. Did you ever use the SAA watercolor paints, UK? I have not, but my friend Rich, the spin doctor, has. I think he has a tutorial. Um, not tutorial. I'm sorry, a review on his channel of those, and he he has told me he doesn't really care for them as much as other products that he's tried. I've ordered stuff from that company. I've ordered like Windsor & Newton products before because they're cheaper than getting them in the United States. Um, but I've heard their their proprietary watercolors are not that fabulous. Is there paper tape down? No, it's a block, which means the uh, all the pages are sealed on all four sides. So it's like a pad of watercolor paper, except it's like a pad on every side. It's bound on every side, basically. Uh, I'm trying to set up a warm and cool three color palette. I'm okay with the yellow and reds cold. You name some popular blues and indicate whether each is warm or cold. Uh, cool blues. I like thalo blue the best. That's a really versatile color because it's so strong. Um, I like uh, Prussian blue, but Prussian blue is not quite as vivid. It's a little more earthier, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, those would be my probably my two picks. Indothrone blue is similar to Prussian, but it's not a very vibrant blue. Um, I got a set of Royal and Langnickel watercolors and tubes for Christmas. Are those pretty decent? They're they're a uh, great student brand. Um, use I would recommend either using them fresh from the tube, or if you want to squirt them out into a palette to dry, put a little honey or glycerin in the pan so that. Um, so that they don't crack and fall out when they dry because that's the only downside with those is that they will uh they can crack and dry out fall out of your pan could you just use any kind of watercolor on different types of paper uh you yeah you can use any watercolor on any paper uh what is a good affordable 100 percent cotton watercolor paper i love my arches but it's getting a little too expensive for me right now uh, try Aqua B. Amazon has it for, I think it's under $15 for 50 sheets of 6 inch by 9 inch. That's what I do my practice pieces on. Uh, like whenever I have a, a uh, practice um, painting before a live stream, that's what I do it on. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice paper. It's fairly robust. It's a little weaker sizing. Like it doesn't, like your, your water's not going to beat up on it so much like it would on an Arches paper. But, um, but I really like it. I mean, it's definitely... It's definitely worth the money. It's probably one of the best bargains out there. Also, Grumbacher has a acrylic paint pad, but that works really good for watercolor. And I don't like their watercolor paper, so but their acrylic paint pad is great for um, for watercolor. It's brand new. Are you using a pre-made arches block or one you just made out of glue gun edges? I'm using a pre-made one. I mean, when I when I make my own blocks, I'm usually using pretty cheap paper like the Fabriano Studio. Um, I was thinking about making one with the Aqua B paper, actually. But I usually, if you if you shop right, you can find the Arches ones pretty inexpensively. I got this one uh, last year when they had a deal where you it was a block of paper plus like seven tubes of Rembrandt watercolors, and so I got those. And then I realized I love those paints, and then I ended up getting this this set. Um, and this year they had an Arches block with six tubes of Windsor Newton watercolors 
And so I actually grabbed two of those because they were all colors that I used and the um and it was cheaper than the price of one block at the craft store. So what just, size is it? This is nine by twelve. This is what I use primarily. I also buy the paper by the full sheets. Uh, that's sometimes a really economical way to go. Um, I kind of kick myself because last um, spring they, or maybe it was winter, I'm not sure, they had the 22 by 30 inch sheets of arches in a 10 pack for like $27 on Amazon. And I only bought one package and I've been through all of them because I taught a workshop and I, I sold a bunch off to my students because they didn't have access to that paper. And I've just been kicking myself ever since because it's, it's I've never seen it that low again. But, um, but yeah, just keep your eyes open. And that's one of those things where even if I don't need more watercolor paper, if I see Arches paper cheap, I will, um, I will splurge on it. I'm mixing the Cad Yellow and Hansi Yellow Light to get a medium yellow for this kind of goldenrod. I think it's goldenrod in here. It might not be a goldenrod, but it, it has that same structure as a goldenrod flower. And then I'm going to grab some sap green. I'm rinsing my brush off. This is a number four round. I am blotting it so I don't have extra water because I don't want this paint to flow too much. And then I'm going to go at the end of some of those little bits that I just had a little more water in there though. Um, I'm going to the bottom of those little yellow dabs and flicking in a little green so I just get uh, a little more depth to these tiny little flowers. They're too small to really paint any detail but by doing this we can get a little bit uh, more character to them. Have you tried Chinese calligraphy brushes for watercolor? Um, I have. I'm not a huge fan personally of the Chinese calligraphy brushes. They're usually they're also uh, goat hair, um, and they shed. And I don't know if they if they have to um, have to harm the goats to get their hair, but uh, so I can't tell you, I can't tell you on that. But I can tell you they tend to shed a lot, and they're really like floppy. Like if I wet this brush. You know, it's sopping wet, but it will still come to a nice point. But if it was like a, a goat hair brush, it would just flop over to the side and it gets, they get waterlogged and then you have to kind of let them dry all the way out before you can use them again. I mean, I'm sure if you know what you're doing, if you are a, that's like the medium you work in Chinese calligraphy, it's not a big deal because you know what you're doing. Uh, but I'm not very familiar with that. So for me, it's just kind of frustrating. How do you stop being that hard line when a pool of watercolor dries? You want to do that trick where I showed you where I wet my boy dried my brush off and I laid it in the puddle. You need to remove the puddle before it dries to uh, stop the bloom. What I'm doing here is just putting with my liner brush, putting in some little uh, lines, especially around those little buds that we just did with the yellow. It just gives it a little bit of direction. I want to bring that up to the camera a little bit so you can see that a little bit better. Hopefully it's not too dark and you can get that. I don't want to put it too dark. It's not really a dark um, element in the picture. I'll paint it a little bit darker so you can see it. I just think little additions like that give you a lot of movement and look pretty nice. We're gonna do the same thing over here in these freesia flowers, which I've made way brighter and more colorful than they are in the reference photo. But they have these little um, spots that add a nice direction to the petals. And notice they are in, you see them on the interior of the flower, on those back petals. And here where you're seeing like a side view, if you have a side view, you can see some of them through the petals like that. I'm gonna do that with a liner. If you're more comfortable working with a shorter haired brush, you can. The advantage of having a liner are the long bristles. Because the bristles are so long, they hold a lot more paint and water, so you don't need to reload as often. So if you're using a shorter bristle brush, just reload more often. There's absolutely no reason that you have to use a liner if you prefer not to. Um, I've just got these paints that you're using, and I've noticed that when using them wet on wet, I still get small bubbles on the paper. Have you noticed this? What can I do to stop this? I have not noticed that with these paints, but in the past, when I've noticed that, it's it could be that you're you haven't cleaned your brushes, or you didn't rinse. You might have washed your brushes with soap and water and not rinsed them, or you might have some soap residue in your water bucket, or your paper might have a funky um, sizing on it. Uh, usually, it's usually something with the water or some residue in your brush if you're getting that, it sounds like a soapy residue. So I make sure your brushes are rinsed out really well because that's what it sounds like. Or if you're using some paper that's a little unusual, maybe it's maybe it, it has some, um, some different sort of sizing in it. What type of uh, water bucket are you using? I really like this. It's actually meant for decorative painters. 
like uh, acrylic toll painters. It's a divided water brush. I believe I, I've had this for so long. I'm looking to see. It's by Lowell Cornell. I just lifted it up and looked underneath. It's um, just a water basin by Lowell Cornell. I believe they still make it. If they don't make this one, I know there are like rectangular, rectangular ones like that, but I like it because I can have my two buckets of water, but it's just one item on my table. So it's really great, especially in this in the winter where I'm working at my upstairs table, which isn't as large. So again, I'm using the Burnt Sienna. I did pick up a little bit of the green on my palette just to darken it a little bit because Burnt Sienna has a red undertone. So if I add a little green to it, it gives it, <coughs> excuse me, it gives it a, um, a more brown undertone. So this one, I'm going to just put those little spots in on the back petals. Could you do this on like a regular canvas? Yeah, if you wanted to use acrylics, absolutely. Or if you wanted to paint it with watercolor ground, you could do that with um, with your watercolors. I think I want to add a little bit more form because it's gotten a little, a little loosey-goosey. So I'm actually going to switch to a different type of brush. I am going to use a angular, flat angular Aqualon brush. These are pretty inexpensive um, in sets. That's a Royal and Linical Aqualon and um, the first watercolor brush I ever had was a golden taclon like this, but it was flat and it had the acryl end, which means it's a scraper end, which is really handy, especially if you don't like to use the credit card scrapers. Um, but the reason I'm going to use this is because I can load up the tip of this with a um, with a color and it can the color can fade across the bristles. And I'll show you what I mean here. I'm going to grab some magenta and just put it on my palette like that. I'm going to clean off my brush. You want your paper towel handy. I'm going to blot your brush on the paper towel and just one side, blot one side of your brush. And you're going to pick up the, um, the paint and so just right on the edge and it's going to creep its way across. But then if I go and I wiggle along, this is kind of like a one stroke technique. I can get this fade, the side loaded fade in of color and it looks nice and natural. Um, do you ever use white? I think it says gochi. Gouache? Gouache or whatever in your watercolors. Or are you a purist about saving white? I used to be a purist, but then I realized that there are, there's, I think that it's, it's good to learn how to use a whiter paper, you know, learn that traditional way. But, um, there, there are times when, you know, you change your mind and something that you, or, or a painting goes wrong and you're either going to be throwing it away or you're going to be using white. And I think it's much better to keep pushing through and experimenting, especially when you get to that point where you think you're just going to throw it away because you can be really free because you have nothing left to lose at that point. So, no, I, I think you should do whatever suits your painting the best. Um, and you always hear that, well, if you're going to put it in a competition, then, you know, then you can't use gouache. But you know, if you're learning, I don't think you should really be worrying about joining competitions. You know, learn, have fun, experiment, and uh, I, that's 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 what I would do. I don't, I don't, I uh, I think it's important to know kind of the rule, quote unquote, rules, so that you can confidently break them. Where did you buy your paint? Um, I got this set on Amazon for one thirty four when it was on a crazy deal. But I buy some, I buy on Amazon, I buy on Jerry's Autorama, I buy on Blick, I buy on Cheap Joe's, I buy from The Merry Artist. Um, I just started watercolor painting. What's a good set of brushes to buy? Or can I just use my acrylic brushes? You can use your acrylic brushes for watercolor if they're the kind with the golden hair or the white hair. As long as they're not too stiff. Um, like the plat they're synthetic is what you want. Uh, you want this, you're not going to hurt anything by using your acrylic brushes for watercolor. Although once you invest in some watercolor brushes like these, don't use them for anything but watercolor. Keep them for watercolor because watercolor is so gentle. It, they're not going to hurt any of your other brushes, but other paints can hurt your watercolor brushes. Um, I've been trying to buy a watercolor size product to do a resize, a very old Arches paper block. It is called something else. I can't find anything called watercolor size. Watercolor size. Oh, um, it's a type of glue. Uh, you can probably use um, some gum Arabic and you could probably thin that down and brush it over your over your paper and that would help. Um, 
If anybody has ever purchased watercolor size and can help out, please let us know in the chat. I've never done that. Uh, I have had older paper where the sizing's gone off. What I probably would actually recommend is getting some watercolor ground, uh, which is a product made by Daniel Smith, and I think Golden might make it as well. And what it is, I'm doing the side loading technique again, but with the um, CAD red here. Uh, and what it is, is like a primer. It's almost like a watercolor gesso. Uh, that's what I would recommend using if you've lost your sizing in your paper. Are there any canvas hacks to use watercolors? Also, do you also do you do any digital Photoshop except your paintings? I don't do any digital paintings. Um, and the hack would be the same as what I told the person looking for sizing. Use um, Daniel Smith uh, watercolor ground, and you can paint that on any canvas and then use watercolors on it. So now after I've side loaded the edges of this flower, I am dragging some veins down with my liner brush and that CAD red. And I think this, this looks like a freesia as well to me. I'm going to put some of those little dark spots. And you could use red plus green for those dark spots if you didn't have anything. Bless you if you had that on your palette already. I think that might be a little too watery. Let's try that. I just don't want to have too many runs. So like, even though we started off really crazy and loosey goosey, you, as you progress in your watercolor painting and your paper dries, you're going to be able to get that detail. So don't worry about, um, kind of everything going crazy on you. You can, as you work and your paper gets drier, you're going to be able to get those details. I want to work on the, the jar a little bit and let the flowers rest. And uh, sometimes it's nice to work on another part of your painting so you can get a good, when you look back at those original spots, the, the places you have been working, you have a better perspective. You just let your eyes have a little break. If you're painting at home, um, you're watching the replay, you can always pause the video and come back later. I'm gonna turn my paper a little bit because I wanna get the threads on this. And if you want, you can go in with your watercolor pencils and sketch that. I just wanna give the, uh, Give the hint of it there. I'm using a really watered down bit of that teal. Um, it says, I'd love if someone could figure out how to make your own watercolor ground. Yeah, you'd need something kind of chalky and absorbent. I don't know what they use in that. It is, it is an acrylic, it, it's an acrylic based medium, but I don't know exactly what they use. It's kind of, it is kind of pricey. I will, I will say that. Have you used your watercolor brushes with an Indian ink? Will it ruin them? I wouldn't use watercolor brushes with India ink. Um, you could use any of your acrylic brushes though. They have a little bit of a shellac in them and that could damage your, your really delicate hair brushes. I'd treat them more like an acrylic cause they are permanent when they, when they dry like an acrylic is. I'm gonna turn this around cause I feel like I've got this a little bit misshapen here like I've lost part of the edge so what I'm going to do is grab a hog brush this is a Maxine's mop it's a little rounded filbert here and I like it because I can kind of erase mistakes just by going in and I can scrub it out and push that paint where I want it and this again is also an acrylic painting like a toll painting product so that's that's something um, the products that come out for Toll Painters, which was a kind of more of a mass market hobby, more people did it, um, are pretty good quality and very low price. So um, that's a great, great source to look for brushes and other supplies so that you can save a little money and still get a high quality product. And I wanna get some of the, um, the foliage inside of the vase as well. So you wanna make sure that if you're, that you're letting the foliage refract a little bit, so you don't want it to have it perfect. You want it to be like if you've got a thread from the jar going through that you've broken the, uh, the green line. How do you and what do you use to wash your brushes? I just rinse them usually in my water bucket and let them dry flat and then put them in my jar. But if they get really dirty, then I, I'll wash them with either a little bit of dish soap or brush cleaner. Usually dish soap will do the trick for watercolors. It's not, they're, uh, they're not tough to wash. You know, they, the stuff doesn't get stuck in them like acrylics or oils. 
Have you tried any of the homemade watercolor paints I see on Etsy? Any different in a company made paint in a homemade one? I have not, actually. I have not tried any of them. What do you do with all your art? Does it just go in a book, hang it, give it away? I sell it usually. Um, I just actually closed down my shop that I rented in a nearby town. Um, so I'll be putting it on my website uh, shortly, lindsaywyrick.com. Actually, soon my husband's going to be joining us uh, in the business here. So yeah, that will be one of his his uh, tasks. He'll be updating the website and putting uh, artwork on there for sale. I used to give a lot of it away, but now then I thought people might think I was just cheap if I was giving away a painting. Not that I think that I need, I, I love to get artwork, so please don't, I don't, I would never think somebody was cheap if they gave me artwork, I think that's awesome. But you know, you always get more self-conscious about your own work, I think. And any colors that you used, you can make reflect in the water, in the um, in the vase as well. Um, I now have American Journey tubes, but looking at the pan set, the forty eight. Is that a question? Yes, it says question. It says I now have American Journey tubes, but looking at the pan set, the forty eight. I don't know what that means. Ah. Uh. It doesn't sound like a question. It says question from the um, Maybe they're looking at the American Journey 48 set? I The American Journeys are the same as Da Vinci, which are a nice paint. I've, I use those for teaching a lot because they're such a, val such a great value and you can get them in big tubes. Um, and I've used the American Journey watercolor crayons and they are lovely as well. Uh, so if you're... I think American Journey is a great paint, so if you are considering that, I don't see anything wrong with them. Um... How like how to price watercolor paintings? That's a, I'm really bad at pricing art artwork, so I would not, I wouldn't be the best person for advice. I know I price mine way too low, uh, according to other artists that I've talked to. So it's so tough because it's, it's uh, I don't know. It's pricing your own artwork. It's 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 hard to put to put a value on something that you that you make. I think I'm not a good person to ask about that. <laughs> I often hear artists warn me, warning about greens that are not that easy to do, but they never mention what exactly their diff what the difficulty is with greens. Can you explain what the pitfalls are with the greens? Um, well, a lot of greens right out of the tube don't look very natural, and you have to mix them. Like, so if you have a thalo green, you usually you'd want to mix that maybe with a a warm yellow uh, to kind of neutralize it a little bit, or even an orange. Um, I think that's probably, that's probably the thing is just to not take the greens just as they come to just make sure that you are not just taking convenience color and you're actually mixing to make sure you get the color that you want. Hopefully that's what you meant. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm going to flip this around because I still feel like my jar is a little, a little lopsided. Do you, know, do you want to know how many viewers are on? Yeah, how many are on there? 391. Wow, that's awesome. Maybe you'll hit 400. Ooh, tell your friends, guys. Can we hit 400, do you think? I don't know. That's a lot of people. I think so. Oh, you're at 393 now. Ooh, awesome, guys. <laughs> we got some recruiters out there, I think. This is one of those little squared off mason jars, I think. So i got to do something to help sell that shape so i'm gonna do a little bit to pull a little bit of a corner in here um so how long have you been painting i started with watercolors when i was seven i started drawing when i was five i was lucky enough to have a local artist that lived across the cornfield from me where i was growing up and um and my parents realized that i had no athletic ability very young <laughs> and so like yeah if we put her in sports she's gonna break every bone in her body so let's Let's uh, get her into art. <laughs> and I think my dad wanted me to be an architect because he was a builder. But uh, I really never had that much love for precision. So um, so I loved art, but I didn't like I didn't like precision. Um, so here we are. <laughs> 394. Wow, guys. Wow, maybe we will get to 100. That's awesome. 400. What's that? You mean 400. You said 100. Oh, 400. Yeah, 400. 
talking and painting at the same time is difficult. All right, I'm going to go back to the flowers. 196. Oh, wow. (laughs) I'm going to go back to the flowers and the foliage a bit because I feel like um, I'm just kind of going in circles with the vase. So this is what I mean about hopping around. We might even grab some regular color pencils uh, before we're done here. And that's kind of fun, too, because then you don't have to plan so much if you know you have a semi-opaque medium that you're going to be, um, be working with. I want a little movement up here, so I'm just putting in some strokes of sap green. That's a great right from the tube color. It's a nice convenience color. Um, Phthalo green is also a fabulous color, but you do need to mix it with other colors that you have. Your oranges, browns, reds, you can get some really beautiful greens and neutrals that way too. Um, How would you go about getting painting, getting a painting turned into mini cards? I'm thinking about painting my wedding invitations and next year's Christmas cards. You can use a service like, um, well, you can, you can go to your old local copy shop and have your stuff printed on glossy cardstock and that works really well. Uh, if you're doing a huge volume, you could go to um, like Vista Print and order it there. You can even go like any of your drugstores or Target, any of those places will do photo cards and you just would upload a picture of your artwork instead of, um, instead of, you know, a photo and they could do it that way too. So it just depends on the finish that you want. But um, it'd be pretty inexpensive to like go to go to Target and do it. And you could always just order one or two and see if you know it's up to your quality standards. And if so, then you could order more. And if not, you've only wasted like fifty cents or whatever they charge per card. It's not a lot. Mom, you're three hundred ninety nine. Wow, one more guys. And then it went back to three hundred ninety seven. Oh darn! But now it's a three hundred ninety eight. <laughs> I can't take this emotional roller coaster, Maisie. <laughs> it's wavering. That's a lot. That's a lot of people for an art, uh, an art stream. It's not like a popular game gaming stream. I like this little bit of turquoise in there. I think it really pulls out the color from the uh, the vase a lot. I'm gonna go with a bigger brush. I'm gonna do the number twelve round. I don't need to. I don't need that much water. I feel like I want to do something down here. Maybe get some uh, reflections on the table from the vase. I would just like to ask, how do you fix warp paper after painting? Um, sometimes it will just flatten out on its own. But something else I've done is um, I have spritzed the back side of the pap- of the paper, uh, and then like. Um, laid a book on top. Well, I probably spritz the backside of the paper, lay a piece of saran wrap or wax paper down, put a book on top, and that will do the trick usually. Or you could glue it down to a piece of uh, mounting board, mat board, foam core, something like that, and put a book on top to, uh, to flatten it. We get some of those colors up there to, uh, from the top of the bouquet down into the tabletop as well. I'm going to do that by spattering into that water that I just put. Do you think there's a big difference between, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but Sennelier and uh, Rembrandt? Sennelier and Rembrandt. They have, uh, they, they, they're they both good. I would consider them equal. However, they do have different characteristics. Rembrandt is a more vibrant paint. Uh, it is... Uh, I would say better for more direct uh, applications like this is, I'm not doing a lot of layers, I'm just kind of directly painting with it. Whereas Sennelier is a very luminous paint that works because of the honey content, I think it's it's really great for layering and layering and layering. Um, if you layer too much with some paints, you get kind of, everything just becomes homogeneous. But with Sennelier, um, it just seems to have a good, I think the the transparency of the paint and the I think the amount of gum arabic and honey they have it just makes almost like veils of color a little easier so it just depends on the way you work if you do a lot of of uh, like botanical or layering I think that you really love the Sennelier um do you sell this art after I do first come first serve uh, I have a my email address whoever is the first to email if there's like several people that want it the first person that emails gets it and how often do you change your water 
after I'm done painting, usually. Oh, you hit 400. Cool. If you look at my paint here, my bucket's kind of, you know, stained. But this is the dirty side. That's a clean side. I always wash my brush here first, and then I pick up fresh water there. So, I mean, I could paint all day long, and this side would just get dirtier and dirtier, and that side would still stay clean. So that's why I use the two buckets. Is it important to stretch the paper? Um, I don't think so. Not if you're working from a block, because that's kind of pre-stretched. But if you're working on a really large sheet of paper, uh, or a thin sheet of paper, like a 90 pound paper, then it's a good idea to stretch it. Or if you're gonna really soak it. Any other questions? Um, when is it a good time to stop working on a painting? Whenever you're feeling like you, uh, you don't know where to go, if you're feeling like you're stuck or something's really bugging you and you can't seem to correct it, that's a good time to take a break and come back to it. Um, whenever you think your painting might be done would be a good point to stop and then you can come back to it. Um, because it usually takes a lot longer to correct a mistake than if you just walked away and came back with fresh eyes. I think I'm going to switch to colored pencils and then I might come back with some more watercolor, but I feel like um, everything is super vibrant right now and I could more efficiently tackle this with some colored pencils. And I've got my Prismacolors. You can use obviously whatever brand you have. And I'm going to start off with a just a gray. This is warm gray. I think I actually want a cool gray. There we go. I got cool gray, 70%. You don't have to have that many. I just I'm not going to use that many colors. I just want to kind of get some of the get some of the shadows in here. And you could use a watercolor pencil if you want to be able to dissolve it. So it's completely up to you. Sometimes I like to sketch on with a um, with a regular color pencil because I know that I won't be able to dissolve it and I know I'll be able to keep my lines the whole time. What made you want to do art on YouTube? Um, well, I I was a professional artist, uh, art teacher, and once I had my twins, I it was just too much to keep up my studio downtown and I didn't want my kids to be in daycare. When I just had one child, I brought him with me and I had a, a nanny that would come and, or a babysitter that would come and watch while I watch him while I was teaching right there. Um, so when I got pregnant with twins, I realized that it was time to close up shop because, you know, you can have it all. You just can't have it all at once. So um, be, by be, being able to do this on YouTube, I was able to still teach, which I'm really passionate about, um, but I could do it from home during nap time. Have you ever done watercolor? I don't, does it say call? Collage or college? Is this a watercolor painting? Watercolor collage. Here. Uh, uh huh. I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, do you mean like cutting up a watercolor painting and collaging it on something else? I'd have to look that up, I guess. Okay. I am going to put the little uh, words back. Here. An explanation about the best application for Rembrandt versus Sennelier paint was very was really useful. Could you make a list of that info for more common watercolor paints for your website? Oh, that's a good idea. Um, I can try. I'd have to see if there's. I mean, cause I mean, really, there's not that much difference between when you get into an artist quality brand. Um, the thing about Sennelier does is is I think specifically a little bit different um, because it has that that quality um, but I'll, I'll see if I could think of some like unique characteristics of of the different paints now here where I'm doing this this words down here where it says self sealing I don't want to have I just want to get like part of some of the letters your brain can fill in the rest you probably answered this but <clears throat> well, <coughs> you okay? Water. Oh my goodness! <coughs> what <laughs> what color brushes would you recommend? <coughs> what kind of brushes? I really I cannot speak more highly about the Mimic value set. Um, I didn't link it below, but if you go to any of my past watercolor uh, <laughs> tutorials, you'll probably see it. Last week's, I think I had it in there. Um, it's such a wonderful set, and it's quite affordable. It goes on sale usually between twenty. 
uh, five and thirty dollars regular price all the time it's usually around 50 so to get that I think it's like seven brushes in there and it just I use that that set almost all the time and it's just a really useful great set I would highly recommend that or Princeton Neptune or Royal and Lane Nichols Zen if you live somewhere where you can't get the mimics um like to the live show and first chat is there a dry, is there is there a drawing for this lesson not for this one because we sketched it together so if you just go back um to the beginning of the video you can see how we sketched it together but sometimes i do have the have the drawings if um if we're not sketching it together i am mixing up a little bit more of this dark green and adding some into the bottom here sometimes i just need to attack it with a pencil and then it gives me a lot of uh it kind of gives me that oomph i need just just to change gears a little bit Is there a different look in the paint if you left the paint air dry or use a hair dryer? No. I like to layer watercolors over color pencil too. It because it it kind of fills in the scratchy marks of a color pencil, but um, the color pencil also resists it if it goes on top of it. It just you, you don't lose any of those lines that you put in, which is really nice. And I'm going to do some shadow on the tabletop itself, I think. Need, do you need to wet that watercolor pencil again, or do you just leave it as it is? This is not, this is a regular wax colored pencil, like the, your Crayolas or any kind of regular colored pencil. These are, it has to be a Prismacolor. This happens to be a Prismacolor, but, um, but no, I mean, you can do this with a watercolor pencil and you can choose to, to wet it or not. Uh, the reason I like to grab the Prismacolors to go in there is that I know that what I put down will stay. And sometimes I feel like, especially if I'm doing a loose painting, that I kind of lose a lot of structure. And so that way, if I'm feeling like everything's getting a little mushed together, I can go in with the pencil and then I can I can keep those lines. But it's, it's a complete personal preference whether you want to do this or not. Do you use sealant on any of your watercolor paintings? I don't, no. But I, I frame mine under glass. And then like if I'm shipping it out, I would ship it in a in a acid free bag. Uh, so that it wouldn't if it like if the box got completely wet or something, it wouldn't hurt the painting. The painting would be protected inside. I'm grabbing a little turquoise pencil here. And I can layer it on top of um, any of the uh, the gray that I already put there. I'm not a big fan of sharpening pencils either. I usually let them get pretty, pretty dull. Um, that just keeps me from getting too fussy with anything. But you can sharpen it, obviously, if that's what you prefer to do. I want to get enough color down too, so I can use a white color pencil to pull a little, little sparkle out of, out of uh, things here. And I will find a white color pencil now. I almost throw away my little short pencils because I get kind of they kind of disappear in my I put all my pencils in a um all my Prismacolor pencils in a spice rack and that photo is is on my website today my blog today um and I really like it except these little shorties kind of fall down and I can't really see them that well but I want to use them up um how do you start how to get started making your own mats thanks I love your videos I have a tutorial on my YouTube channel, um, and I think if you even go into my channel and you click on the community tab, I shared it on the community tab recently. Um, but yeah, I just get a handheld, I got a handheld cutter for about 20, 25 bucks, and a long metal ruler for about $3, I think. And that's what I use to cut my mat still. And I like it because I can do any size. When you buy a mat cutter, you're limited to the size of the mat cutter. And, um, you know, it might be a little bit easier to use, but you don't have that versatility. And it gets really expensive. Those mat cutters are, you know, can be a couple hundred dollars. So I really recommend going handheld if you have the strength to, uh, you know, to hold down the ruler and cut. I'm not a terribly strong person and, and I can do it. So it's a, so much cheaper than buying mats. And you can have exactly what you want. 
And like when you buy your mat board, you can use up all the scraps. You don't have to like, when you go and you buy a mat, you're just getting that mat. When you buy a piece of mat board and you cut your own mat, you've got all the insides, like the windows that you can use for stuff. Um, so if you cut like a 16 by 20 mat, then you've got that middle that you could cut an 11 by 14 or an eight by 10 mat out of, and you can get a lot more, you know, a lot more bang for your buck. Should I buy the mat paper in bulk? Um, if you have a, if you have room to store it, if you don't, then that's, it takes up a ton of space. I actually got rid of a bunch of mine. I gave it to the local school because I just needed the space back. And, um, I had also, I bought a lot in bulk because it was a framing shop going out of business and I did manage to use up enough that it definitely was worth the purchase. But, um, yeah, I saw that I had so many colors. I keep white and black on hand in bulk, but the other colors, not so much. I'll just order those as needed now. So, you know, just be mindful of what you have for space because it takes up a lot of space. And if it gets wet or um, damp or anything, you could lose your investment. Maisie, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. I'm grabbing a little bit more of that turquoise color. I'm going, I like to go over, like I mentioned before, over the um, the shadow colors that I did in the color pencil. I just think it helps make it look a little bit more realistic. And the nice thing about alternating in with the colored pencil is that um, it gives you a little bit of a freshness. And recently I reviewed some new Prismacolor pencils because uh, people had told me that they didn't, that like the quality control had been going going down and I all my pencils were older. And so I bought a small set of, of some new ones just to test them out because I was kind of, I didn't want to recommend them to anybody um, if they weren't good anymore. But I think they, the set that I got was fine. I think maybe they've gotten past their quality control issues from moving their factory. So, um, so I'm, I'm really pleased. I'm, I'm glad that I got that little set and I'm glad that I can still recommend them to people because they're so lovely, especially on top of watercolors. Um, question from Lori Hill. I don't have regular colored pencils, but do have a complete set of watercolor pencils. Is it safe to use watercolor pencils as long as you don't apply any more water to the paper? Yeah, they're going to work just about the same as, as regular wax colored pencils and not quite as opaque. But um, yeah, totally, go ahead. You can use use what you have. That's the best the best supplies that you can use, are the ones you already own, the ones that are bought and paid for. You're gonna learn, and you're gonna learn so much more about the materials you have. So anytime you see me do a technique, even if I've linked up the products in the video description or I have a sponsor, go ahead and use your stash. That's what you should use first. And then if they don't do what you want to do, you're either gonna learn something new about the products you already have, or you, um, or you'll realize what would suit you, what would be a nice addition, and what you might want to consider spending your money on in the future. But it's always a good idea to use what you have first. It's just plain soap and have to clean watercolor brushes, or oh, should I yeah. use the master's cleaner? Oh, plain soap is fine. The master's cleaner is fantastic for oil and acrylic because it really does get that residue out. And I've even brought brushes back from the grave that I thought were would have to be thrown away with the master's cleaner. But your watercolor brushes, you could like, finish up painting, not even rinse your brush, leave it there for five weeks, come back and wash them out with baby shampoo and then they're going to be fine. Um, so yeah, so you don't really need anything special for watercolor. Gentle is best for watercolor. If you have time, can you talk briefly about Mr. Clean Magic Eraser for fixing mistakes? Um, well, you know, I've never used it on my paper. Um, I've used it to like r to clean a watercolor palette if my paint wants to beat up on it. Like brand new watercolor palettes tend to want to, your color wants to beat up instead of like spread out. And it works great for that. But I haven't actually used it in a painting, but I have heard that it works really well. So I'm sorry, I, I really can't give you any firsthand info on that. And this is optional. You don't have to do this with a colored pencil. I'm just having a lot of fun playing and uh, and hanging out with everyone. Geez, Maisie, Daddy's going to join the uh, join the business. You might have to join the business too. You're doing such a good job. What about Sarah? We have Sarah too. It'll be a family affair. Besides, you still have to go to school. <laughs> 
Is there a swap program for supplies? A swap program? Oh, I'm sure there's groups on Facebook that, that trade and swap supplies. There's also a website called Wet Canvas, and I haven't um, been there recently, but they had a lot of forums for artists, so I'm sure you could like swap or sell. Well, actually, I shouldn't say I'm sure because I haven't been, I haven't, this is usually where I found great articles if I'm wondering about a particular brand. Um, I find some good information there. Uh, if anybody knows of any swap or sell sites, I'm sure there are Facebook groups. There are for, for crafting, so I would assume there would be for art as well. Please share them in the comments. I don't know if you can share links if you're not a moderator, but if you can just maybe share the name of what the groups are called, that would help help people out. Or you can like go into the um, into the chat, into the, I'm sorry, the comments section after the live stream's over and you can leave a link. I'll probably have to go in and manually approve it, uh, but I will, as long as it's like a relevant link to an art group that we were asking for. Um, that master's cleaner you just talked about, where can I buy it from? Um, you can, I would shop around. Jerry's Artorama has the, I usually get this, there's a big like cake of it in a tub and there's a smaller cake in a tub. I get the smaller one because um, that will last me a couple of years and I think they would get kind of big and the big one would get really kind of slimy after a while. So that's what I would recommend. Jerry's Artorama has it. Amazon probably has it too. Um, I'm sure Blick and Cheap Joe's has it. So I would just kind of shop around or if you have an open shopping cart that you're, or a place you order from anyway, that's a pretty popular product. Most stores should have it. I think even like your craft stores probably have it like, um, you know, your big box craft stores like Michael's or AC Moore. Probably not Joann's, but you know, the ones that sell, regularly sell art supplies. What website is your favorite for art supplies? I probably shop Jerry's a little more often than others um, because they tend to have the stuff that I use the most. Um, and to be fully clear, they are a sponsor. Not They're not sponsoring this particular broadcast, but they do sponsor um, several broadcasts a month. So I just want to put that out there so you know. Um, I shop there probably the most. I also shop from Dick Blick, Mary Artist, and that's M-E-R-R-I Artist. Um and cheap joes so those are those are my my main ones in amazon of course for like paint sets amazon is usually the cheapest but if you just need like a tube of color like one tube of color or you know stuff like that they're usually more expensive on amazon what is your favorite watercolor set for traveling and studio um for traveling i i got a portable painter recently i think i actually have it within reach i can show you um i really like this it comes empty you have to put your own your own stuff in it but the thing that i love about this because like i mentioned i like the two buckets of water is that you have two buckets and they slide on the end of the palette and i've taken this out on a kayak and i've taken this on a like a field trip to Cupabello island with my daughter's eighth grade class and you know anytime i had a second i could just open this up you know dump some water from my water bo bottle on each side plop this over my knee sit down wherever i'm sitting and start painting um, and it comes with a tiny little brush in there for travel as well. Um, so this is this is great. And then you fill it with whatever colors you like. The thing, the only thing is, it comes with pans which are great. If you have already have pans like this, chances are they're not going to fit. The only pans I saw that fit in here as is were like the Windsor and Newton ones. So you will need to like probably refill fill the pans with what you have from two paints. But I love the versatility of this palette. Um, my studio palette that I I used to use more than anything was my Jones palette with M Graham paints in it. I love having the big area, but um, because I don't have that much space upstairs, I really like this Rembrandt one because I can have any color I want pretty much and I have plenty of room to mix for the size I paint here. If I'm painting really large and I like my Jones palette or my Pike palette filled with, you know, M Graham paint or whatever paint that I happen to be, you know, loving at any given moment. So, you know, it's such a personal thing. There's so many good products. Um, I think as far as a large studio palette, though, I would recommend the, the Pike palette over the Jones just because the plastic is a little bit more durable and thicker and um, nicer. But I also love this palette. See, I can't pick a favorite, guys. This is hard. I love this one. This is a ceramic palette, and it's great for if you just want to put a couple pans in here or you just want to squirt, squirt out a little bit of paint. It's I really like using a ceramic surface, too. Um, 
So, and even if I told you my favorite, it might not be your favorite. I would just kind of figure out what you really like to work on, whether it's ceramic, plastic, or metal, and go that way, because there's so many wonderful options. We live in a time where we are spoiled for choice. Do you have any videos about painting values using a single color? If not, would you consider doing one? And this question was asked where I'll go, but it's okay. Um, do I have, I have a, uh, a painting tutorial and it's, it's a winter scene and it's done in two colors. It's burnt sienna and ultramarine blue when we mix different values of grays from that. So I would recommend checking that one out. Uh, if I can, if one of the moderators could find it and link it, that would be great. If not, I'll try to remember after the broadcast and put it in the comments or put it in the video description. Um, yeah, winter scene in two colors might be the name of it. If you just Google, uh, if you search winter scene on my channel, there's like a little magnifying glass that should, that should bring it up for you. Um, do you have any favorite watercolor related books for demos, references? Yes, I do. My absolute favorite watercolor instruction book is called Everything You Want to Know About Watercolor by Mary Appeloff. And I don't think it's in print, but I have seen it occasionally on Amazon. And for just general reference books, and I linked this to today on my um, on my blog, thefrugalcrafter.wordpress.com, is uh, The Artist's Photo Reference Series by Northlight Books. And I can grab one real quick and show you. I just recently found these on um, on Amazon. I've been looking for them forever and I they, they had a, bu a bunch of different sellers had these for anywhere between like three and twenty five dollars and I bought everyone I didn't have and I'm so happy I did. The prices have skyrocketed. They're now like between like thirty and a hundred dollars. So you know I would keep your eyes open because I did I was able to find them all very this is the one I spent the most on this one was twenty five. All the other ones were like four, seven, you know, they're all from different sellers on Amazon, but they, uh, they arrived fine. They arrived quickly. I couldn't be more pleased. So that would be my advice. Now, something else I think it might be really fun. Uh, I'm just going to reach over here and grab it. I recently got some paint pens. My husband got me these for Christmas and they are acrylic paint pens by Posca. And, um, I thought it'd be fun to play with these. And I did actually link these up on my, um, on my blog post today because I was talking about how I, changed um you know my office to a winter art space because the cellar is cold and i mentioned these pens uh because they're something i'm keeping upstairs and i just love how i can get a really nice bright white slice of color here so that would be kind of like like if you were going to use gouache um i'm looking for some higher grade art supplies and i just want to know what kind of paints and paper i should try um, I would say if, I don't know what your budget is, but if you can swing some Arches paper, I honestly, I, I find that if you can find the right paper, even though it might be more expensive than what you're used to buying, if you don't buy stuff you, you don't like and that you can't use, you're going to save money. Arches is tried and true. I've never had a bad experience with any of the Arches paper that I've used. I would just recommend if you can swing it, get a small block of arches or a pad of arches and um and and see what you think and then you know just just keep like a little savings jar of you know when you need to restock it's it's so much better to have like one type of really good paper than than a bunch of you know not so not so great paper and i've never gone wrong with arches i'm just putting some highlights in with this pen this is a really fine tip hard plastic nib too because a lot of the, the acrylic paint pens have like um like a foam or felt oh, they, sorry they have like a felt tip nib and i find like these are really nice really fine tip like you could sign your name with these they don't like the scratchy sound oh sorry i know that's right next to the microphone too okay i'll put that away then um and i want to get a little bit of yellow maybe some search chartreuse or some yellow on the leaves well you'll notice with with uh with pencils the brighter the darker the color the more transparent it is the lighter the color the more opaque it is so if you are looking for something because you want to lighten something up over a watercolor you want to pick something that's a little bit more opaque like this creamy yellow your more vivid colors which you would think well those are going to be stronger those are going to show up not necessarily because if you're trying to go over something that is uh, a little bit darker you want to have something that's lighter in a colored pencil because it's going to be more opaque do the posca pens dry matte yes 
would you use the same technique as you're using to do the jar with water in it to do an underwater scene? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I would. And you know, that would be a good, um, a good thing to play with if you wanted to mix your, um, your medias because you could do some regular colored pencil sketching and then you could layer some watercolor over that and without losing your sketch underneath. Or you could even try some like ink tense pencils because they'll stay pretty much where you put them and you can layer over them with watercolor without smooshing them around, but you still get that look of watercolor. I purchased the Yarpo watercolor paint and then I purchased the White Knights paint set. Now I have been hearing that they're the same paints. Have you heard this? By the way, I love your tutorial. Thank you. Yes, they are the same. They just have different trade names because they're marketed to different um, to different customers. Um, there are a couple like Yarka has three different sets of twenty four uh, with different um, with different color color values, and um, so you might have different colors. But if you just have the standard Yarka and the standard White Knights like set of twenty four, you're probably gonna have the same exact colors in both of the um, in both of the sets. Um, what I'm doing right now with art, well, right now in our class, we're doing ink printings so we can print on the fabric, and, like, I really like to draw and paint things, like, scenic. Aw, means you got a question. <laughs> All right, so now I'm just going to look here and see what else I might want to add. I could just kind of play with for hours and just keep you know adding to and experimenting with so I think I'll probably wrap it up here pretty soon so if you have any last minute questions go ahead and pop them in the chat so I can get to you okay. is the white knights 12 pants set good for beginners I really want to try them but I don't know if they are too professional for a beginner like me that's a great set and that's usually a pretty affordable set too. Uh, the thing that I really like about the 12 set, and I don't have the 12 set, but I am familiar with the colors in there. You have like a warm and a cool version of each color and that's what you want. In fact, if you're a beginner, starting with a limited palette is probably the best gift you can give yourself. Sure, this is lovely, but you're gonna learn more with that 12 set of colors and you are with this. This could actually hinder you. Whereas the 12 color set, it's enough to get to pretty much mix any color you want and you're gonna know so much more about color theory. Um, by playing with that than you ever would from this because this is overwhelming when you're you just too many variables uh, so I definitely would recommend Which that 12 color, color pencils set. are you using? Prismacolor and I do have a review on the new ones because I heard so much stuff about them not being that great uh, but I think they've gotten past their quality issues and I really like them I and I have the full set of polychromos and I still will reach for these because I like the soft thick um, leads. I like that. I like that quality. I like the opacity of them. I love that I can put like a, a dash of color on top of a watercolor painting and it will actually show up. It's not for, you know, everybody has their own, their own preferences, but I really like these. What do you think, Maze? Do you think it looks done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone that joined us today. How many people did we end up with? Did we have, we hit 400? I think, I think we, the highest I saw was 410. 410. That's awesome. Well done, Maisie. Awesome, guys. Thank you so Keep much. Drawing. Please. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this tutorial. Of course, it will be available for a replay. And if you want to see uh, the winter studio set up, how to set up a small art space, that article is on my blog, thefrugalcrafter.wordpress.com. And you can find that along with links to the supplies I used today and the other stuff I talked about. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please hit that thumbs up button before you go. It really helps my channel. And um, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, after the live show is done so that I can see who was in the chat. I don't get to see everybody while I'm here painting and it's always nice to say hello to some familiar faces. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy crafting. Bye!